I have a confession to make. I am not a cat person. Cats are stinky, mean, and those eyes show how uncaring those miniature felines are. There are only a few cats I enjoy, and the one cat that I love to see is Puss in Boots. Ever since I was young, Puss in Boots has been one of my favorite characters among the plethora of great DreamWorks characters. Puss in Boots first appeared in DreamWorks Shrek 2 and is voiced by Antonio Banderas. Since then, Puss in Boots has become one of their most popular characters. But there's a little more to Puss than what initially meets the eye, and there are a lot more layers to this character. So I just want to take a little bit of time and make an analysis about the character of Puss in Boots. As is the case with most characters in Shrek, Puss is based off a fairy tale of his own. The original story of Puss in Boots is quite different from what we see in the movies. The original story of Puss in Boots starts off with an old miller divvying up his estate between his three sons before he dies. This miller doesn't have much, but he gives one son the mill, the second son a donkey, and the third son the family cat. The third son clearly got the less helpful part of the estate, and the cat agrees with his new owner. So this cat sets off to make his new owner filthy rich. Yep, this cat is Puss in Boots, but without the boots yet. After getting some boots from his master, Puss starts to capture hares and bring them to the king while hyping up his owner. After bringing rabbits to the king's court for a while, Puss instructs his owner to wash in the river by the road. This is because the king will be riding there later. When the king's entourage is marching down the road, Puss hides his owner's clothes and tells the king's convoy that a thief stole his owner's clothes. The king isn't happy about this, since he knows Puss and he has heard a lot about his master. So he has some servants get some clothes for Puss's owner. During this time, the princess thinks Puss's owner is attractive, and they eventually get married. And that's the shortened and simplified version of the Puss in Boots fairy tale. Puss quite literally scammed the king. When Puss was first envisioned, he was really just a clever cat with boots, and was able to talk to people. It's also funny that one of the brothers received the family Donkey, and in Shrek 2, Donkey and Puss do not get along at first. Speaking of Donkey and Shrek, where are the ogres in this story? After all, Puss was introduced in Shrek as someone who was able to dispatch ogres, but there were no ogres in the original fairy tale. However, while this might be the original rendition of the story, that doesn't mean that this is the only version of the story. The original story of Puss in Boots was written in 1553. Eighty years later, the story would be modified in 1634, and it is this version that has Puss encountering an ogre. You see, when I was telling the original story, I kind of omitted the fact that Puss went around to a bunch of fortresses and used intimidation and blackmail to make a whole bunch of domains claim to be owned by Puss's master. This is in order to impress the king into thinking that Puss's owner is really rich. The only problem is that an ogre owns the territory, and will complicate the deception. So Puss decides to deal with the ogre. In this version of the story, ogres can shapeshift into all manner of creatures. When Puss meets with the ogre for dinner, Puss asks the ogre if he can transform into giant and ferocious beasts. The ogre obliges to this question and transforms into a lion. Puss continues on asking questions about the shapeshifting to appease the ogre's ego, and Puss states that the ogre could not possibly transform into the small creatures of the world like rats and mice. The ogre takes the challenge and transforms into a mouse. Puss then turns to the ogre and says, Oh wow, that's impressive! By the way, I'm hungry. Om nom 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 nom! And just like that, Puss defeats the ogre by eating it. It's a fun story where Puss still gets his owner rich with clever tricks and being surprisingly social for a cat. In this story, Puss demonstrates how smart he is, and how he is able to turn people's strengths into their weaknesses. But that still raises the question of why Puss in the movies is dressed in a black hat and wields a rapier. The reason for that gets rather interesting because this version of Puss in Boots is technically a combination of two public domain characters. The fairy tale of Puss in Boots, and the character of Zorro. Do you remember how Puss in Boots is voiced by Antonio Banderas? 
Well, Antonio Banderas also played Zorro in a 1998 film titled The Mask of Zorro. Zorro's first appearance was in 1919, and was created by Johnston McCulley in a series of serialized novels. Zorro is typically portrayed as a man dressed in black with a black cloak and a black mask covering the upper part of his face. Zorro is typically an acrobatic combatant, and his signature weapon is a rapier. With these tools and skills, Zorro stands up for and defends the people from the tyrannical government officials, and when Zorro has done his work, he leaves a quick Z at the scene of his fights to let the corrupt government know it was him. If it makes it easier for you, imagine Batman, but Zorro came before Batman. Funnily enough, Zorro is also Spanish for Fox, which fits the acrobatic and cunning nature of the character. When Antonio Banderas was cast for the role of Puss in Boots, the animators started looking at other movies Antonio Banderas had been in for inspiration on how to create Puss. The animators saw The Mask of Zorro, and they decided to take inspiration from the movie when they were making Shrek 2. These elements of Zorro can be seen in Puss in Boots, since the DreamWorks animated version of Puss wields a rapier with a black hat and boots, has a Spanish accent, and will mark a letter P on the wall where he has struck, very similarly to Zorro. It's also cool to see that Puss takes elements of his design from Zorro. However, this merger of characters can be tricky with intellectual property laws, since you could risk a lawsuit if a character bears too close a resemblance to a character that someone owns. However, this isn't the case for public domain characters. If a character or property belongs to the public domain, it typically means that it is not protected by intellectual property laws and copyrights, and belongs to the general public. There are many layers of complication to copyright laws pertaining to the public domain. The thing to focus on here is how fictional characters can enter the public domain. There are some characters out there that can't have a copyright label slapped on them because of how old and widespread they have become. Since there is no single person who owns these characters, the public is allowed to integrate the character into new stories in a transformative manner. This is why we are seeing so many Pinocchio productions in such a short time frame. We are getting two Pinocchio movies in 2022. One, a soulless live-action remake by Disney, and the other, a stop-motion animated film directed by Guillermo del Toro. There is even a Soulsborne-inspired video game coming soon, with Pinocchio fighting mechanized enemies. This is all because Pinocchio entered the public domain in 1940, so he can appear anywhere, including the Shrek movies. There are a plethora of public domain characters that you are likely familiar with, such as Dracula, Frankenstein's monster, King Arthur, Robin Hood, and a shocking number of Disney characters are taken from the public domain. Fun fact, the original 1933 film version of King Kong will be entering the public domain in 2028. And would you look at that, the characters of Puss in Boots and Zorro are both in the public domain. Or at least they are mostly in the public domain. Zorro is mostly in the public domain since copyright laws surrounding characters can sometimes get confusing. While Zorro was created in 1919, and with the passage of time, the older versions of Zorro are now in the public domain. Copyright laws will typically last around 95 years, and as of the writing of this video, the productions of Zorro before 1926 are in the public domain. Even though the trademarks and character of Zorro over the past 95 years are controlled by Zorro Productions, Zorro is able to take new forms, and in this instance, merge with the Puss in Boots fairy tale in order to create a new character. This version of Puss in Boots takes the best qualities of both source materials. He is an anthropomorphic cat that can speak, and the gymnastic and athletic aspects of Cats and Zorro are preserved here. When it comes to the apparel of the character, Puss still wears the boots that were in the fairy tale version, but now he has a black hat and brandishes a rapier to fight, although he still uses his sharp claws to fight and maneuver obstacles. And his internal persona has benefited from this mesh of characterization. Normally cats are portrayed as mischievous tricksters, 
and while that is seen in his behavior, there is still a noble and honest side to this cat. Antonio Banderas plays this part perfectly, and brings a Spanish accent and wild charisma to the character. And since Puss is a cat, he is able to do this. Very few people can resist the eyes. This interpretation of Puss in Boots has become very popular, since he has appeared in all subsequent Shrek movies after his first appearance, has spawned his own movie and spin-off shows focusing on Puss, and now has a sequel to the Puss in Boots solo movie that is finally coming out. It really goes to show how popular this character has become. Even in Shrek Forever After, Fat Puss steals the show. By combining the fairy tale of Puss in Boots with the characteristics of Zorro, DreamWorks has managed to create a truly fantastic character that stands out from the lineup of animated characters, and even live action characters. Audiences have seen Puss in Boots in many adventures, and hopefully we will see Puss in many more adventures to come. Hey, uh, thanks for watching this video to the end. I, uh, I don't know a good outro. So, um, like and subscribe, I guess? Oh, well, whatever. You do what you want. Bye.